Good morning, Grace Warman. Welcome here this morning. Uh, we are going to be continuing on our series in the book of Philippians today. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to say um, thank you to you as a church for praying for um, our family and my brother's family uh, this week. Uh, my brother and his family are very thankful for all of the prayers that you have prayed for them. And uh, we just really appreciate the church coming alongside and suffering with, in a sense, and praying for one another. And so thank you so much for that. And if you would continue to pray for my brother and his family, that would be um, greatly appreciated. So I, I want to say thank you. And he did tell me uh, yesterday that he was, uh, for those of you that know, he was uh, injured quite seriously. And he did tell me yesterday that he was doing uh, really well. So thank you for praying for that. And thank you to God for even answering uh, prayer already. And so, yeah, thank you so much, Grace Fellowship. Anyway, um, moving on to Philippians, uh, here at Grace Fellowship, you'll know that um, if you've been with us for any length of time, we tend to go through books of the Bible chapter by chapter or verse by verse, and we do this because we believe it is the best way um, to really, I guess, understand uh, what is written in Scripture. It keeps the passages within their context. It prevents us from just uh, preaching about the things that we like to preach about. It doesn't allow us to uh, skip through difficult subjects and just cherry-pick the easy ones. So ultimately, we believe that you get the clearest picture of who God is, who Jesus is, and who the gospel is, or what the gospel is, I should say, by going through Scripture like this. Now, we don't always do this. There are times that we might uh, feel that we need to take a ch chunk of time to work through some subjects that might be pressing for a certain um, time when specific things might be happening in the world around us or in our community or in our lives in this particular church. But for the most part, we do go through books of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And that's what we're going to be doing again this morning. Two weeks ago, we were introduced to this church at Philippi uh, through Dr. Luke's account of the very beginnings of this local church. And just kind of helping us understand a little bit of who this church was. And then last week, Clay, he did a great job of bringing us through the beginning of the letter that Paul wrote to this church some 10 years later. And we went through chapter 1 up until verse 5. And today we're going to be taking uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. So if you could turn to that passage with me, Philippians 1, uh, verses 6 to 11, and have it open in front of you while we journey through these verses. I think you're going to find it super helpful. Um, if you're a bit unfamiliar with uh, the Bible, you will find uh, Philippians towards the end of the Bible in the New Testament section. And what we'll do is we'll play the passage out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray and go through this scripture together. Reading from Philippians chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. All right, before we dig into that passage, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you this morning for this letter that Paul has written to the Philippian church. And I thank you that it speaks to us today uh, as it did to the church back then. And I pray that you would just open our eyes and ears to understand what you've written in your word. I pray that you would give us a clear pic picture of the gospel through this letter to the Philippians. And, and I pray that it gives us a clear picture of how salvation for your people is completely dependent on you. And you do not fail in what you set out to do. So we can rest in peace, knowing that you've, you've done all that we need for the forgiveness of our sin and for life with you. Our salvation, it, it doesn't depend on us, but on you, and, and that's a good thing. So I just pray that we would rest in that this morning, find peace in that. Amen. All right, so just a wee little bit of context so that we don't get lost in the story. Uh, last week, 
Clay uh, took us through the first part of chapter one, the first five verses. Uh, we saw that Paul wrote to this church that he was extremely grateful for the church. He thanked God often for this church and the role that they had played in advancing the gospel, both in that community and in the cities that Paul had been on a mission to during his lifetime. And after Paul had planted this church in Philippi, the Philippians had partnered with Paul in very real ways for the advancement of the gospel, both near and far. Um, he, they gave to Paul of their, their time, their talents, their resources, money, uh, so that the gospel would be proclaimed and God's kingdom would expand through, through Paul's preaching and of, of everywhere that Paul went. And so Paul was extremely grateful for the significant role that they had played over the last decade in Paul's missionary journeys. And so he tells them that he thanks God for them because how God has used the church to encourage him, to help him, to fund him, as he declared the good news of Jesus to the world that are to the places that he was on mission to. And so with that intro, let's dig into verse 6 of our text this morning. And this is what Paul says to the church. He says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul is super thankful for this church and all that they have done for him in, in the name of Jesus and the gospel. And he loves the people in this church. And, and what he has seen of them their generosity with their money, their time, their, their hospitality, what he has seen in them has given him a confidence, not in them, but in God, specifically that God would finish what he had started in them. He saw in them such change and, and such a love for Jesus and a strong fire to make sure that others also heard the good news of Jesus, that he was confident of their salvation. What had started with a few people in Philippi, a few people hearing and understanding the gospel, repenting of sin, and believing in Jesus would end with God completing his work in them. And this is very real encouragement from Paul to the church. Notice how he said he was confident that God would complete his work in them. Paul sees that since their salvation, God has been working through these people, changing them day by day into a people, into a church that's becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And if you've been a part of a church sometime, you will have heard of this word uh, sanctification. And essentially what this sanctification word means is to make us pure or to make us holy. And this is what Paul is talking about here. When God saves us and forgives us of our sin, he doesn't just leave us there, he changes us. And as we get to know Jesus and understand the gospel more and more, we start to despise sin more and more. And God works in us to make us more like him day by day. And Paul could see this process happening in this church. And even though they, they were by no means sinless, and, and they weren't perfect, he knew that God would not stop working in them until they were. God would not stop his work in them mid-process and let them fall away. He would take them to the end. Paul was confident of this, not because they were some sort of amazing people, but the fruit of salvation that they bore in their lives was an obvious work of God. Jesus had saved them, and they were being changed day by day into a people who loved Jesus and who loved the people of Jesus more and more, repented of their sin more and more. This is the fruit of salvation in your life. It's a sure sign that God has done the work of salvation in your life. And so Paul encourages them that God will not stop his work in them until he is done. God does not give up on his people. Jesus does not give up on his people. If there is suffering or hardships, They need not worry. God will complete his work in them. He won't leave them hanging. One day when they have breathed their last in this world and they get to meet Jesus face to face, they will be declared perfect and blameless and righteous. And when when Jesus returns and we receive our, our resurrected bodies, we will receive perfect bodies, sinless bodies, and his work in us will be complete. When Jesus declared on the cross that it is finished He meant that sin was paid for in full, and it's done. But he wasn't finished everything that he was going to do. He didn't stay dead. He rose again, and he promised that he would also rise our bodies, or that our bodies would rise again one day and be made perfect, and his work in us would then be complete. And Paul is confident of this, and we should be too. If Jesus has indeed saved you, there ought to be fruit of that salvation in your life. And if that fruit of salvation exists, you too can be confident 
that Jesus will not give up on you now. If you're his child, he will never let you go. Jesus doesn't allow it. In John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says this about those who are his children, or he calls them his sheep in this passage. He says, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And again, Jesus said to the, the, the Jewish religious leaders when he was here on this earth in John chapter 6 and verse 39, he says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. God the Father has declared to Jesus the Son that he should lose none of his children. And Jesus is the one who will raise God's children on the last day. The work in us will be complete, and we will be living in righteous perfection at last. So Paul's confidence, it did not lie in the people of the church, but in God, that God would make sure that these people made it to the end by faith. And the reason Paul was so confident was the partnership that he had with them in planting churches, in being on mission, and all the fruit of their lives that was exposed to him in this kingdom work. He knew them well, and this made him confident of their salvation. The fruit of their lives gave Paul this immovable confidence that God had indeed saved them. And if they've been saved by Jesus, Jesus will complete his work and he will raise them up on the last day. He will make sure that what was started as a seed of faith is finished in perfection, perfectly resurrected bodies in a perfect city, in a perfect kingdom with the perfect king. God finishes what he starts and he does what he says. So if we as Grace Warman have been saved by Jesus, and we see the consistent fruit of salvation in our lives, if it has changed us and made us new, then we too can have the confidence that, that Paul has, that God is working in us. And what God starts, he finishes. He never lets his children go. He says himself, he will raise us up on the last day. Paul continues on, verse 7 and 8, he says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, some of us might think that what Paul says about these Philippian people sounds a bit arrogant. How can he be so sure, so confident? How do we know this isn't just pure arrogance? How can Paul be so confident that God will his complete his work in them, bringing them into his new kingdom with newly resurrected and perfect bodies? Well, it's because Paul knows Jesus intimately. Jesus has changed Paul, and Paul has seen what it looks like in his own life when Jesus gets a hold of you and changes you into someone new. Paul went from hating Jesus, hating the followers of Jesus, imprisoning them, killing them, or at the very least approving of their murder. He went from that to someone who loved Jesus and his people and to someone who was willing to suffer anything for the good news of the gospel and for Jesus Christ. And he saw the same change in the people of the Philippian church. And so it was right for Paul to have such confidence in what God would do for these people and such a love for these people. He had seen the fruit of Jesus in their lives and they had been partakers or you could say participants together with him or partners with him in the grace of God. They had suffered with him. They had ministered with him. They had journeyed with him. They had given to him for the sake of the gospel and all the hardship they had experienced. They had exp In that hardship, they had experienced the grace of God with him and the fruit of salvation that he saw in his own life was also now visible in them. And he knew them and he knew Jesus and he loved them and he loved Jesus. And they were one and they experienced this time together because of the gospel of Jesus. They had all been partners in the gospel together. They had benefited from the gospel together, and they were one in spirit. And so Paul held them in his heart very deeply, according to verse 7. And in verse 8, he says this, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. 
It was the fruit of the gospel, the fruit of Jesus, the, fr- the fruit of the Spirit that gave Paul not just great confidence in their salvation, but also this great love for this people, this church. God indeed was working in them, and he would carry them to the end and complete his perfecting work on them one day. God always does what he says he will do. And Paul loved this church, and he had great confidence in God doing his work through this church. So he tells them that he will be praying for them, and this will be his prayer, verses 9 to 11. He says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. And so Paul says that their, their, their lo- or he prays, I should say, that their love will abound more and more. In other words, Paul is praying that their love is going to grow. They, they already had such obvious fruit of the love of Jesus in their lives, and Paul could see it clearly, but he wants it to grow even bigger. Even though the love of Jesus was obvious and evident, he prays, Lord, give them an even greater love. Their love is still so so far short of the love that Jesus showed by coming to earth and dying on the cross for these people. And so he prays that the love would grow so that they would be more and more like Jesus. And they would move forward in their sanctification journey to perfection. That the kingdom of God would increase and that they would be filled with the fruit of Jesus. And Paul says he's praying that their love would grow with all knowledge and discernment. Now, it it seems weird to say that knowledge and discernment are not often associated with love, but rather love is often described as sort of a funny feeling inside or butterflies in the gut or just maybe an intense desire. You know, those things are often viewed as love today. But Paul is clarifying that true love comes through knowledge and comes through discernment. And as your knowledge of who Jesus is increases... Your love for him and for what he loves increases. It works the same way with everything in this world, even if we might not realize it. But the more we understand something, or the more we think we understand something, the more we either love it or hate it. When we know we don't understand something, we're usually fairly neutral about it. It's tough to love or hate something that you don't really know or don't think you know. I'll explain. Now, I, I'm a car guy. <laughs> I like cars, and some of you know that. Probably sometimes a little too much. And I, I do love a good supercar. Now, a supercar is a sports car that costs a lot of money. It has the engine in the middle. It's called mid-engine. And so the engine's right behind the seats, and it's just really cool. And it gives the configuration of the car just this unique and beautiful overall shape. Supercars are beautiful cars. Now, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini would be an example of this, and they are two of my favorite brands. Now, I'm never going to be able to own one, but the effort that's put into the designs, the execution of the designs, uh, and, and, and how the car works together, like they're just pure works of art. They're beautiful. Now, at first, when I, when I see the cars, they look good to me, real good. I, I definitely like them based on looks only. They are pleasing to the eye. If you've ever looked at a Ferrari or you ever looked at a Lamborghini, you know they look really good. But as I study them and get into the specifications of the car and start to gain more knowledge of, of what makes up the cars and what their capabilities are, my love for them increases. They're more than just good looking. You know, got lots of power, like, It goes 0 to 60 really fast, like three seconds, big noise when you step on the gas pedal, and all of this makes me enjoy the car even more. Understanding that the manufacturing process of these cars is so much more complex than the average car and so much more precise, and and, and it takes longer to make up the cars, and sometimes they're they're handmade, and it, it just... All this knowledge helps you appreciate the the effort that's put into them. There's no cheap plastic parts, but there's luxurious materials like carbon fiber and exotic metals. Now, if you ever get a chance to sit in one of these cars and feel the Italian leather on the seat and the Alcantara steering wheel and you put your fingers on the touchscreen and you just get to experience it firsthand, your love for the car just increases even more. 
And what puts it over the top is when you have an opportunity to drive one of these cars. Now, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to drive one of these works of art. I knew all about the car. I had seen them in pictures. I had even been up close to them in like downtown Phoenix or Vancouver. Uh, I, but I had never been in one. I had never driven one. Now, I had the choice between driving a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. I chose the Lamborghini. And I cannot tell you how much more I loved that car after I drove it. I wanted one. <laughs> Before I had driven it, I knew the way the car looked, and, and I liked it. I studied its capabilities, I, and I liked it even more. And the effort put into the super high-end parts and material made me love it even more. But when I got into it and drove it and got to know it, on a much more intimate level, my love for it, I think, increased tenfold. Now, I don't ever want to compare Jesus to a car, because that would do Jesus a great injustice. But I hope this helps you understand the concept of our love for him growing with our knowledge of him. Paul had seen the very beginning of this Philippian church. And he had shared the gospel with, with a businesswoman and her family. He freed a slave girl from demon oppression and, and shared the gospel in prison. And the prison guard or the, the jailer and, and his family were saved. And, and all of these were baby Christians. And, but all they knew at the time of their salvation was that Jesus had died for their sin, rose again so that they might have eternal life with him. That's all they needed to know to love him. And to have faith in him. It's like looking at a picture of a Lamborghini Huracan STO. And, and I just need to look at the picture to know that I love that car. But it's just the tip of the iceberg of all the things that will increase my love for it. Just like the knowledge of the good news of the gospel in its simplest form was just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to Jesus in the gospel that will increase our love for him when we know these things and grow in our knowledge and discernment of who Jesus is. We will grow in our love for him. When this Holy Spirit opens your eyes to the truth and you understand your own sinfulness and realize that Jesus died so that your sin would be paid for, it stokes a love for Jesus within you. And when you understand that he didn't stay dead, he rose again so that you might have life with him your love for him grows even more. And when you get the fact that you're adopted into the family of God because of what Jesus has done for you, giving you true family, your love for him increases more and more. And then when you understand that as a child of God, a brother in Christ, you receive an inheritance that only Jesus is worthy to receive, then your love for Jesus grows even more. And when you understand he's coming back for you, making all things new, new heaven, new earth, new bodies resurrected from, from the dead for eternal life with him in perfection, then your love for him grows even more. And when you experience Jesus working through the power of the Holy Spirit through the local church, your love for him grows even more. With knowledge of who Jesus is and experience of Jesus' power in your life, what he has done, his love, his justice, his character, his plans. The knowledge of all these things only increases our love for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And when we experience him through the church, through the fellow believers, our love grows with knowledge and discernment of who Jesus is and what the gospel is. And Paul says he is praying that this church will grow in love with knowledge and discernment, but he's praying it for a reason so that we may approve what is excellent and that we may be pure and excellent for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of Jesus more and more until that day when we meet him face to face. He's praying for this so that we know and we affirm what is good based on what Jesus says is good. It's, it's so that our wants, our wishes, our efforts, our finances, our things are to be used in such a way that is excellent according to God so that we might be pure and holy on the day of Christ. Paul wants us to grow in our hatred of sin and, 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 and our love for Jesus so that when Jesus comes, we will be pure and blameless. It is at this point that we might think that it is our effort that will get us to be that pure and blameless. But remember verse 6. It is God who will bring this work in our lives to completion. He will finish it. It is God who will make us pure. 
and who has made us pure through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul is praying this for them, that God would do this work in their lives, that they would know Jesus more intimately, and through that knowledge, love him more deeply. And through that love, become purer and purer until the day that Jesus come back, comes back and finishes that work in them. And through this knowledge and love for Jesus, Paul recognizes that there will be Christian fruit in their lives. Fruit of purity, love for neighbors, sacrifice for others, distaste for those things that Jesus has a distaste for, and a love for those things that Jesus loves. And this fruit is what was evident in the lives of the Philippian church, and this fruit does something here in this, on this earth. Verse 11, he says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This knowledge of Jesus produces love, Love produces pure fruit, and this fruit of the gospel in our lives brings glory to God. The whole purpose of our salvation, our knowledge and our love for Jesus, our pure living, is for God's glory. He is jealous for his glory. He has done everything we need for the forgiveness of sins and life in his kingdom so that he should get the glory. It is God who starts the work of salvation in, in us, on our own, we can do nothing. It is God who gives us the knowledge of himself. It is God who gives us a love for him. It is God who finishes the work and makes us pure and holy and righteous and sinless and pure so that we might be in his kingdom. God does it all, and so he gets all the glory. And that's why Paul prayed this prayer. All that was going on in this church that was good was a work of God. And if it was to increase, if the knowledge was to increase and the love was to increase and, and the fruit or the good works was to increase, it would all be a work of God. So he prays to God who's doing the work in his people. And that is who Paul had confidence in. He was confident not that the Philippians could do this on their own. He was confident that God would do this for them and through them. So my prayer is the same for all of you, that your knowledge and love for Jesus would increase that you can rest in the knowledge that it is Jesus who works through us, it is Jesus who saves us, it is Jesus who keeps us saved, and it is Jesus who will make us perfect in the end. He always finishes what he has started. And the fruit of our lives is proof, proof positive, or maybe negative, that Jesus has indeed saved us into his kingdom. So we can find rest and peace in that today. God will do his work in us, and he will complete it. Heavenly Father, my prayer today is the same prayer that Paul had for this Philippian church. Would you cause us, Grace Warman, would you cause us to grow in our love for you and your people, that our love would abound in knowledge and discernment, so that our love for you wouldn't be ill-informed or superficial, but real and deep. And I pray that we would strive to do the good works and bear the fruit of the gospel day by day, that in the end you would get the glory for grace warming. Not one of us can increase in knowledge of you without you. Not one of us can produce fruit without you. Not one of us can bring you glory if it is not all your work. And so you get the glory. So fill us with your spirit. Increase our knowledge and our love that you might be glorified. I pray this in your name. Amen.